Hello, everyone, and welcome to season three of the Hidden Pearls podcast. We are so excited and so grateful to be back for another season, um, another season of the show, and also another season of George playing for the 49ers. So let's ride, Faithful. Um, so this episode, the crew is pretty spread out. Um, I'm coming to you from Japan. I'm in Cebu right now. And uh, George is in San Jose. Um, by the time this airs, he will be in Chicago um, playing the Bears this week for week one of the season. And Pops is already in Chicago. He went in early to go to the MVP huddle, um, did some in-person interviews and got some great stories. So we're really excited to share that and continue our partnership with MVP, MERS Union Vets and Players. It's a fantastic organization. Organization. If you are unaware of what they do, um, they partner with uh, former veterans or veterans and former NFL players, and they help them to have a team after the uniform comes off. And so um, at Hair and Pearls Podcast, our goal is all about uniting people through storytelling. And we feel very honored and excited that we found an organization that we feel really supports and furthers our message. And um, MVP is a really great organization. And so if you are... Um, so this season, what we really want to focus on is mental health practices, um, you know, really providing resources for people to slow down and take care of themselves um, for helping you create a plan for your healing, um, you know, and I think just sharing stories that open some doors or maybe spark inspiration in you or in other people or you for other people um, in just ways to live a little bit more joyful and compassionate life towards others and towards ourselves. So thank you for being here. Thank you for sticking around for another season. Um, we have a lot of content coming your way and we just want to say thank you so much. So um, this week uh, for the first segment, Pops is on with GK. Um, they just kind of go over a few things. Um kind of a quick interview because George's practice went a little longer. Kyle, we're trying to do podcasts here. Um, and yeah, and so it's just a kind of quick introduction, um, but we will have guests back on this season and we're very, very excited about it. And then for the second part, um, our MVP guest is uh, Chris Busher, and he's going to tell his story. Um, him and BK really nerd out on biking and um triathletes. And so uh, Pops and I think that this might be the year that we actually sign up for our first mini try. So not diving all the way in, but like dipping the toe. Um, so yeah, kind of getting into that world of ultra running and competing again, which we're both pretty excited about. So um, very fun to hear this story and hear about just the story of resilience and how important it is to show up for yourself, um, but also how much you can use the fuel of other people to continue to push yourself forward. And so I'm uh, very excited for you guys to hear Chris's story. So um, with all that, we just want to say thank you so much. Go Niners and let's beat the Bears. George, how you doing, man? Wonderful. I'm sitting here in the equipment room office next to some of the best in the business, probably the best in the world, honestly. Um, and, uh, you know, just Excited to be back on the Hidden Pearls podcast train with yours truly, Mr. Bruce Kittle. Excited to be here. It's also 222 on my time, so. Okay, which means that the bus is about ready to board and you're about ready to get to the airport. So let's just do a wow. couple things and we'll kind of chat a little bit. Um, Niners have a little bit of a different look this year. Any of the, uh, let's start off with the new captains. What do you think of that? Uh, yours truly, not me, you. Uh, elected for your fifth time, so congrats on that. We're super happy and proud about that. Well done. And then, thank you. Uh, you want to look through the other captains and uh, a couple other long timers, right? Trent Williams, five years. Yeah, we had Trent Williams, who's been a captain for a long time. Eric Armstead's been a captain, I think, the last three years. Uh, Fred Warner's been a captain the last three or four years. Uh, we had Nick Bosa, a first timer, and we had Jimmy Ward, who's I think in the second year or third. We got some. We got some nice. We got some awesome players that are representing the 49ers on the field with a C on their chest. Much deserved, to all the guys. And and you get a gold C now instead of the regular C. Is that it? I do. It's my fifth one, so I get up to the gold C, which I'm uh, pretty excited about. Yeah, it should be pretty awesome. Cool. Well, congratulations to all those guys. And then is that just a team vote? Is that how that works? Yep, it's all the players. We voted on. I want to say Monday, maybe. I think it was Monday. Uh, we voted on it. They're announcing Wednesday. So pretty excited about it. 
Well, that's great. So, well, uh, all right. Then, well, then let's see. Um, we had some new coaches that are on the staff now. I don't know if there's anything to report on that. People have kind of been talking about that for a while, but I just thought I'd toss that out. And also some new players, you know, maybe we'll talk for a second about the tight end room. Um, Ooh. How's, how's that looking for you and how you feeling about all that? Coach Flurry is new, Brian Flurry. He's been on the staff for a while, but it's still kind of a new deal for him. Tell us a little bit about that in the tight end room. Yeah, tight end room, definitely a different look. Uh, we've got three of the same players from last year. Myself, uh, Ross, Ross the Boss, Dwelly, and uh, Charlie, Go Dogs, Warner. Um, and then we added um, Tyler Croft in free agency this offseason. Uh, he played with the Jets last year, was with the Bills before that, he, and Cincinnati before that. Um, be a good player for us. And then uh, we just brought back our practice squad tight end, Troy Fumagalli. Wisconsin's finest, the Badger himself, Big Ten football. Oh, yeah, uh, Tyler Croft's a Rutgers guy, so Big Ten football all the way around. Um, and then Coach Fleury, yeah, he was in our room the last two years, 2000, was it 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021. He was with us. 2019, I think he was on the defensive side. He's been coaching a long time. Um, <clears throat> big fan of him. Uh, I've learned a lot from him already, just in the scheme and the knowledge of the game. So that's been really fun. Um Tight room though it's good. We got we have vets. We don't have any rookies, which is unfortunate because I, I haven't had a rookie since Charlie. So I'd love to um have someone pick up my shoulder pads for me, but I can't make Charlie do that anymore. Um so usually Brock Purdy does that for me, my rookie from Iowa State, the quarterback. I, he was leased to me by uh, the other two quarterbacks. So thank you, Trey and Jimmy. Um that's nice. Yeah, I know. Actually, speaking of that, you got a got a big game this weekend, Iowa Hawkeyes versus Iowa State Cyclones in Kinnick Stadium. Um, you know, so we'll see what we can do as an offense. I has to go out there and put up more than, um, zero points, eight points. So, <laughs> so, I mean, special teams got to hit defense has got to, I think my, my dream would actually be if, if would be if the Iowa won like six to three on three safeties, that would be a dream come true for me. That's um, a big, big game. for would, Hawkeyes. It's a huge game for us. And I really don't want to have to wear an Iowa state Jersey. So Hawks. Please help a guy out, and this will probably be released after the game. So, good job, Hawks. Way to get that dub. Thank you for letting me put Brock Purdy in an all-gray jumpsuit from my freshman year of college that has stains all over it. I can't right. wait for him to wear that. We'll get some pictures for next uh, next week. Yes. Okay. Um, then, so other than the, the Hawks and the Cyclones, uh, any other uh, additions, changes, or whatever with the uh, Niners that are worth mentioning that's kind of jumped out at you that's been great? Uh, any new coaches uh, really caught uh, your eye or other new players? Well, yeah, I mean, coaching wise, like a lot of the coaches were hired within. Uh, coach Ankerson, um, he was he's been with us for I think two years now as a wide receivers assistant coach, and now he's taking the reins. And I like Hank; I think he does a really good job out there. Um, and he's you know former player played in Coach Shanahan's offense, and um, so he's very knowledgeable about it and exactly you know the ins and outs of it to help those guys out. So I think he's been good. Um, CFO, uh, Coach Furster is our O line coach, new the new run game coordinator. So I'm excited about that. Um, I've had multiple conversations with him about the run game that I really, really enjoy. He's a, he's a king. Um, Mr. Bobby Slowick has been um, he's been with us I think four years I want to say, and he is up now to the pass game coordinator, and he's got a lot of knowledge. Uh, definitely sees the game a little bit differently. You got those analytics, and um, but he's got a very good perspective on Kyle's offense and. Is a very good job of explaining exactly what is needed um, to make our offense as efficient as possible and try to make it as easy as we can on the quarterbacks. So we have new coaches in different places. Oh, and we got a new quarterbacks coach, Brian Greasy. Yeah. And I like Greasy. He's fun. Really enjoy engaging in conversation with him. Um, I like former players as coaches because they understand what you've been through. And oh, honestly, one of my favorite hires is Coach Len Anthony Lynn, former head coach of the um, San Diego Chargers and then the Los Angeles Chargers for a year. Um, but always been a huge fan of him ever since uh, he's been a head coach. So I've always followed him a little bit and I've always thought it'd be really fun to play for him. And now that he's on the coaching staff, I really enjoy that because uh, he's got an old school vibe and definitely has some uh, Coach Embry vibes to him as well. I like that old school, played before, been through it, and also been a head coach. So I like guys like that who have both been the head been the head coach, but have also been a position coach because they just have a different understanding of the game. All right. Well, pretty well-rounded. Well, we're going to find out soon enough how all those pieces fit together. So uh, very we are. fun. Well, let's take a look. Last night, the Rams lost a tough one to the Bills. Did you see it at all? Anything you had thought about that? I actually, yeah, watched the majority of that game. Um, Bills look really good. Um you know, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, talk crap about the Rams because they're a really good football team with spectacular football players on the football field. And 
Um, the Bills just looked like they, I mean, they just looked out there. They looked like they were on a mission every single play. Um, every play, they just had this intent and this intensity to them that um, makes it easier. Um, makes it, I mean, gives you a better chance to win. It does make it easier, but it gives you a better chance to win. And um, sometimes you see on a football field, just sometimes that intensity is not met. And I'm going to tell you this, that the Rams, next time they play a game, they're going to have this intensity and they're probably going to beat the crap out of whoever they play week two. So and everyone that's on the, oh, the Rams aren't very good. They got to do this. They got to do that. Matt Stafford's this. Aaron Donald's that. Bobby Wagner's this. Jalen Ramsey got burnt. They're all really, really good football players. And they all want to play at a high level. So uh, they're going to bounce back pretty quick. And I will say thank you to the Bills, though, for um, giving us one up on the Rams. And so now we just got to go out there on Sunday and make us go up, too. Um, but like I said, Bills look really good. Josh Allen, hell of a football player. Um, he continually just gets better and better. And they've got a lot of guys around them that make a lot of really good plays. So uh, their defense looked really good, too. Seven sacks. Yeah, they did. Von Miller has been an incredible add to them. So, uh, yeah, it's just they've got this edge to them and then they got this intent to them. So seeing that definitely, uh, definitely, definitely sets the tone. So excited yeah. about that. Kind of feel the vibe and the way the season's going to be. It's everything's going to be a dog fight. So, all right. Well, speaking of that, we've got a bear fight coming up this weekend. Uh, any, uh, any, so you guys are just about to jump on the plane. You'll be in Chicago where I'm actually at, uh, later yeah. tonight. So that'll be great. Uh, any tips, thoughts on the Bears that you want to kind of jump out at you? I mean, they, a lot of talk here. I watched some of the Bears talk radio. Dan Hampton was on from the, you know, Super Bowl years and all that kind of stuff and just, uh, chirping mm -hmm. quite a bit. There's a lot of confidence in this city right now about that team. Good. That's awesome. I hope they have all the confidence in the world as a Bears fan. <laughs> As a Bears fan, I love that confidence. As a Niners football player, I love it even more. Um, okay. You know, there's one thing about um, playing for the 49ers. You get to go against a top-tier defense week in and week out during training camp, and you get to see how good they are. You get to go against some of the best in the world and what they do consistently every single day. Um, so um, they better be they better be ready for that physicality. Um, I don't know if they've ever gone against someone like that besides last year. And um, – you know, the Bears, I think they have a really good defense. Uh, they got the Colts defense coordinator from last year. We lost to the Colts last year in a rain game, and it's going to be a rain game this Sunday as well in, in Chicago, 90% chance of rain. So looking forward to that, but they've got a really sound scheme. They play an eight-man box. They're in every single gap. Uh, they rely on the corners to fill a lot. So it's um, it's going to be a dogfight. You know, it's going to have to take advantage of the way that they play their scheme and try to get some good plays that, um, you know, influence them in certain ways. So looking forward to that. But I'm really looking forward to seeing our defense play. But, um, you know, I think our, our, our offense was clicking at a very good level this week throughout practice. Um, our wide receivers look really good. Running backs look good. O-line's playing well. Troy Williams looks really fast, which is really scary when he weighs 300-plus pounds and it's going to come right at your face. So, uh, pause. But good for us. <laughs> good good for, for us. us. Good for us. And uh, that boy Trey was out there slinging it. So it's going to be a really fun one. All right. Let's go light them up. That'll be terrific. Well, we'll be there and see you there tomorrow. Uh, okay. We got a category called food, shoes, wine, movies, and Dini. It's your, you get, a, you get a pick. So you're going to choose something about food, shoes, wine, a movie, and or a Dini update. Ooh. Well, how about this? I'll do a couple. Well, I'm currently barefoot right now because my shoes are in my bag. So I got to get, I'll put those on here in a sec. Yep. But I uh, will we'll be wearing the Chicago uh dunk lows they're beautiful shoes uh you'll see me in those both on the airplane and at the game um that's what i'll be wearing what color? then the, uh they're the chicago so they look like uh, michael jordan shoes so okay got red it. white black they're beautiful they're classics uh but i'm wearing those you know a little uh little chicago vibe why not channel mj he's a goat yeah um let's see dini update fluffy and as cute as ever uh miss her already and then lastly Ooh. Um, movie. I downloaded the movie Collateral, which is an old Tom Cruise movie with Jamie Foxx and Jason Statham. So I'm going to give that a sight because I have not seen that, I don't think, in a long time or ever. So I'm going to give that a shot on the plane ride in. All right. All right. Very cool. All right. Then let's see. Uh, those are those kind of things. Uh, I know there's a special person that had a birthday yesterday that you want to give a shout out to. Wow. September 8th, <laughs> had birthday, mom. You're wonderful. Um, we had a wonderful day. We had some Italian food, some pesto pasta, some tiramisu for her cake. It was lovely, enjoyable, good wine. Um, so that was really fun. Got her a bunch of sunflowers for her birthday. And then, cause I asked her, I was like, what do you want for your birthday? A couple days ago. And she sent me a list finally. 
and it was like she had five things on the list and she had she wanted a uh what's the camera called canon that's what it's called right yeah she wanted a can she wanted a canon printer she wanted a canon r5 camera with a really nice lens uh, she wanted a really nice purse she wants a land rover defender <laughs> nice mom <laughs> and she wants uh george to be healthy and then i just won a super bowl so a season season long health so i said thanks mom so if you had to choose one besides the last one because i'm gonna do my best to provide that but what do you want and she chose the camera and i was like i probably would have just chosen the car and then sold it for all the money and then just bought two of the cameras. but that's just me but we had a wonderful day with her um and then also birthday shout out today is elliot williams birthday oh great great guy elliot agoski elliot, uh, Agoski elliot big, part, yeah. big big part of my routine he's wonderful um so yeah you just want to give him a shout out he hates shout outs he hates being people being aware that it's his birthday so i just want everyone to say happy birthday elliot williams he's a wonderful human being yeah great and uh, like you said a really core component of the uh of the recovery program there so i know you got to go we got minutes moments left uh so any just two things what are you excited about for the coming year just like to unfold and what what's giving you hope right now and then that can be football or otherwise hey rob hey bobby um what am i excited about i'm excited football's back i'm excited playing in front of fans um i'm like excited we have a really good football team and it's just we have a lot of pieces in place where we can go out and win a lot of games and uh these first couple of weeks about the season are really fun because you're I, you're just finding your identity as a team like you kind of figure out what works you know throughout training camp and stuff but like it's really when it comes down to it the guys are going to stand up and they're going to perform at a really high level and that's what you find out in these first couple of weeks and so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that and i'm really looking forward to people being able to see what the 49ers look like on film what gives me hope um something that helps me out uh we just moved into a new place in california and um we have a wonderful view i have a pool i have a guest house for my parents to stay in and just being able to be in a spot that has space and i don't have neighbors right next to me um i go out in my backyard i don't see anybody it's uh it's really nice and just sitting there every single day uh, after practice i get home and it makes me really happy to just have that space and to uh be able to be in a house that is really really fun and open so excited about that and that makes me really happy every single day all right and then i'll close out just uh i was at the chicago huddle with mvp on wednesday and yes, you were. uh we did the podcast yesterday with chris busher so people should look for that and chris and the guests are going along with another uh chicago huddle mvp person his name is keith hill he's also a veteran and we're proud to send those folks to the game and we'll have a chance to see them uh after the game so we'll get a chance of that so george you know you got to go get your shoes on uh we appreciate you taking time to see us and uh we're looking forward to just an outstanding year with the niners rising up and kicking some muku butt all the way through the season who's that it's Gilby. Hey, man. And there's Doc. Hey, this Doc. Is Boomer Sooner. Woo! <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, man. All right, Georgie. Uh, we love you very much. And uh, again, thanks for taking time. I know Fridays are a busy day for you. Tell all the boys hi. We can't wait to see you. And uh, look forward to a great game against the Bears. Take care, man. We love you. Love you, too. And there's a nice fat head of Doc. Look at that. Got oh, that a fat is, head of him. Is, is that available Where's online? Gilby? Can we order oh, those? This is Gilby. That's him asleep on the floor. Can we get a link to order those for people at yeah, home? Look, look at all these fat uh, bobbleheads that Rob has. Oh my! It's just I know we got the, good stuff in here. This, the equipment this is, like I said, is just, this this is top tier equipment room, probably best in the world. Um, it's actually incredible. <laughs> these boys are just built different. All right, love you, pops. See you, man. Thank, Thank you, all you for listening. See you guys. Bye. All right. Uh, just a couple other things I wanted to hit on before uh, Georgie had to catch that. We, he got held up at practice, so we didn't get as much time with him as we'd like. But next week we will have a guest with George. And so that'll be and it's uh, I want to make sure we're confirmed, but I think we are. But that'll be released shortly. Uh, two things I wanted to mention is one is just a mindfulness mental health update. You guys know that we're working with MVP. And uh, particularly, uh, we've had an opportunity to kind of engage with uh, going to the huddles with uh, more players and vets, and that's been great. Uh, I just want to do a shout out for Jay Glazer's book, um, one of the founders and a Fox analyst. 
uh, Unbreakable, if you haven't read it or thought about it. Uh, he talks a lot about his struggle with depression and anxiety and what he calls living in the gray. And it's a, it's a very different kind of read. Uh, Jay is a very different kind of dude. Uh, but that's kind of where we're headed with all this is that we're kind of okay with our differentness. You know, we're all a little bit different. And um, nobody's really normal. And so uh, let's not try to pretend that we all are. And let's work on being authentic individuals to who we are, as long as we're not hurting anybody else. And uh, try that. So giving that a shot. Um, just also a reminder that if you're living in the gray and there are issues and uh, you're struggling with some stuff, there's always people around. So you have our contact information through our website. So feel free to hit us up. We follow that all the time. And uh, if you need any help or resources, we can provide those. Uh, just a reminder, it's always okay to acknowledge that at this moment, you may not be okay. And none of us are completely okay all the time. So uh, that whole thing is a myth and a bunch of bullshit as well. So don't buy into that crap. And so, uh, and if you're not quite okay and you need a little bit of help with it, then get some. And the quote of the week for our mindfulness mental health update is that your biggest commitment is to yourself first. Your biggest commitment is to your health to yourself first. So just a reminder that you have to take care of yourself. Um, hard to fill up other people's cups if your cup is completely empty. So don't let it dry out and crack. And so make sure you're taking care of yourself, a little bit of time off, encourage breath work and a little bit of physical activity, but whatever works for you. Uh, let's see. Then last, uh, just want to update. We've done some great things we're really proud of. Uh, so you can kind of check out the HPP podcast or some other stuff out there. Reminder, tight end you. We finished this year just under $700,000 raised for charity. Uh, we've been to the MVP LA huddle and the Chicago huddles. It was great. Those great chapters. And we're hoping to make the Phoenix, Arizona one shortly. And we got a couple others coming up. So we're going to try to make those. We also visited Operation Surf. There's a podcast up on that. Uh, or will be shortly. I can't remember, but we've done a few pieces on that. That's where they take veteran surfing, uh, Avela Beach in California, diving with heroes. We did that in June. Uh, went down to Cozumel, diving with some uh, uh, veterans and uh, really saw the impact uh, on disabilities about being underwater and how that helps. And so that was a great trip. So thanks to them. And we were at the Sweetville Mustang Ranch. Shout out to uh, Michael and Patricia uh, for hosting us and the MVP crew there for equine assisted healing. So that was really cool. So we've had a really fun uh, summer, busy August, meeting up with MVP people and looking at healing and just getting to understand the issues and the transitions a little bit more. This week's show with Chris, uh, you're, I hope you'll really enjoy that. Chris is a very interesting dude, uh, Army, and uh, a lot of the stuff that he dealt with was post-Army, and that made it a little bit more interesting, but he just ran his first triathlete triathlon, and that's a great story, so I hope you stick around for that. Uh, and also, just a shout-out Next Door Solutions, Second Harvest, Cafe Momentum. Uh, we've been sponsoring and supporting them, and uh, encourage you guys to think about groups that you might be able to support and that meet your passions as well. And uh, also to youth football, uh, flag football in Nashville. So we're trying to support them as well. So um, I'm excited about the coming year. It's going to be great. Uh, a lot of new faces on the Niners, but at the same time, enough uh, foundation blocks. It's a pretty powerful team. And so we're really excited about that. And we'll learn more about all of that on at Sunday's game versus the Bears here. And the things that give me hope is that I find more and more people talking to each other, uh, accepting each other, loving each other, and doing so without judgment and with more grace. And the more I go around to the MVP huddles, the more I get out with both veterans, former athletes, and just people in general, have conversations. There's, I think, a growing urge, need, desire, recognition, um, that just a little bit more compassion all the way around, that life is tough. <laughs> it's tough enough without us making it tougher for other people. So if we can come together a little bit and build some bridges and uh, make this world a little bit better place for everybody. We're all good. All right. So that's this part of the show. Stick around for uh, Chris and myself having a chat about uh, his uh, entry into the Army, his experience, his two deployments while he was in the Army, infantry rifleman. And then uh, as he comes out back to Chicago and some of the things he dealt with and what got him into cycling and eventually into running his first triathlon. So great show. And uh, we thank Chris for being a part of it. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks so much. Hey, hey Chris, Bruce Kittle here. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right. So Chris is a member of the uh, MVP huddle here in Chicago and uh, was referred to us by actually folks both on the national level as well as local. So we're very uh, excited and thrilled to have 
Chris with us to be able to tell his story. So, uh, Chris, we were chatting a little bit about, so there's some background stuff. Maybe I'll, I'll just review a little bit of that, um, and then uh, you can fill in some blanks for me. So, you grew up in Chicago. I've got Oak Park, mm -hmm. if that's right. Uh, Correct. Family, you're the second oldest of four siblings. Correct. Right? Okay. Uh, your father was U.S. Navy, a Vietnam veteran, and your mom was a nurse for 40 years. And I guess in advance, I will offer my condolences because I know part of the story and I know part of it is that your father recently passed in 2020 from COVID. Correct. And your mom, uh, very recently, last, this April, uh, after a, what, they're never quick, but I mean, fairly you know, quick turnaround, um, mm -hmm. passed the cancer in April of this year. Correct. So um, condolences for that, and we'll kind of come Thank back you. to those pieces. So, um, so that's kind of where you grew up, and then I've got this piece in. So this is all about your journey, and so all my headings are called journeys. So this is journey into soccer because you put in there um, that you went to Oak Park River Forest High School. You're the Bar City Soccer <laughs> MVP 1993. Seeing there, there's MVP already showing yeah, up. MVP. You are the most valuable player. <laughs> All right, and then you went to Lincoln College, attended Lincoln College, and you were the varsity soccer MVP 1995 there. So in that bundle of stuff, what, anything else you'd like to kind of fill in on? And I guess the one question I'd ask about your family was just, uh, you know, when you look back on it now, how, how did your family kind of shape you? And maybe what were some core lessons you learned out of your upbringing? Uh, I think my growing up, I think uh, it's normal suburban life. Come home when the street lights are on. Um, you know, strict at times, but, um, you know, my parents were supportive in everything that I did. Um, soccer was a traveling sport, so um, a lot of road trips. So, you know, I think childhood growing up was really good. All right. And any core lessons? I mean, you take back and look on it that has shaped you as you sit here today? Uh, work hard. Got to work hard. Um, you know, there's nothing better than hard work. Okay. All right. Uh, and then what, tell us a little bit about soccer. It seems like you uh, gravitated toward that. You really loved it. And what maybe were some of the strengths that you had that resulted in these prestigious awards of MVP in both <laughs> classes? And then maybe what were some of the challenges and lessons out of your soccer world? Uh, well, there's some great lessons that I learned in soccer. Uh, soccer is a, a form of art. Um, one-on-one -on -one challenges, uh, learning how to, you know, pass, move as a team. Uh, I just fell in love with it. Um, as far as some of the lessons that I learned, teamwork, you know, team concept is a very good thing. I think it's important for a lot of young kids to you know, work together as a team, you know, just some great things. Um, but uh, I was... I worked what, hard. What made you the MVP? Uh, what, was it, what was your primary position? So in high school, I, my primary position was forward, attacker, left, right. Um, you know, as a kid, my father always trained me to go left-handed and right-handed, uh, or right foot, left foot. Uh, and that paid dividends going forward um, in high school and in college. All right. Now, your dad grew up in an era in the United States where soccer was not a thing. Definitely not. Right. I mean, that's kind of, when I grew up, it was like the foo-foo thing in Europe. Somebody did. Still is. Right. And I ended up coaching <laughs> a lot of soccer, though, because when my kids grew up, it was like all the rage. I'm sure. Yeah. So how did your, I mean, was your dad a coach? Uh, my dad was a coach. Um, I think I coached, or he coached me for one year. And then after that, he was a coach for my brother and sisters, my little brother and sisters. Okay. He loved it. So he adapted to soccer pretty quickly. Absolutely. And, yeah. He was it is, probably a little hardcore. Everyone wanted to be on his team. But, you know, with his military background, I think that's why they liked it. Yeah. A lot well, of structure. Yep. Structure, good drills, organization mm -hmm. to the team. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I could just uh, see a retired Navy guy uh, having some influence on that. So, yeah. It, and you know what? It is a marvelous the, the team and the, the interplay between the positions and depending on where the ball is and how you move it. It's just, it really is an art form. I think. Way. I think in a lot of ways it's like many other sports you know from an offensive standpoint you want to pay attention to the player you know your defender uh, yeah. the way their hips move the way their knees their feet their eyes and that's something that I gravitated to I learned how the players move and you study them so it was I loved it yeah I still love it right so uh, 
And have you played much since then? No, but stay tuned. I stay think tuned. Gonna, it's I coming think back. It's, I think it's going to happen. It's coming back with the. <laughs> I think um, the stuff you sent me. The last line was "change is possible." Change is possible. So, and change opens up opportunity, and uh, it's, it behooves us to review those opportunities as they start to appear. Absolutely. Because they come and they go. They do. And they're not always around forever. They so, are not. Okay. Then 2008. Uh, so from 2005, 90, or so somewhere in that, so after Lincoln College, so 95 to 2008, kind of did a variety of different things and then eventually decided to hook up with the Army. So what was that transition like? In, or do I have the wrong date? No, that's right. Okay. Um, so after college, I worked some various jobs. Um, I finally settled in for a small technology company. I worked there for nine years from a warehouse employee wrapping cables to becoming the sales procurement manager for the company. Um, it was a great job, learned a lot about it, learned a lot about myself, but uh, at the end of the day, there was more that I was I was chasing in life. And um, at my job, I had a conflict with the owners about my contract. And at that time, uh, I decided it was time to leave. Um, you know, growing up, I had sports after high school, uh, played soccer, played soccer in college. Um, my childhood was raised around a bunch of Vietnam veterans. Uh, my dad always had parties. Um, all his veteran friends came over, heard all the military stories of Vietnam, just the good stuff, the bad stuff, and it, it was amazing. Um, and at the end of the day, I think I still had that passion inside to serve. Um, granted, I was about 32 years old right. when I joined, but um, no regrets. Okay. No regrets. You know, one thing we didn't talk about with your father, you know, which one of the experiences that we have with MVP is um, the gift of service that veterans provide to both the country and to the military is a great thing, but it does come at some cost. Um, and obviously between combat and or other things that can happen. Did you, as you were growing up, did your father talk about some of those things? Did you have kind of a, at least an inkling that there might have been some kind of impact? And I don't know what your father's experience in Vietnam was exactly, but. Absolutely. Uh, my father was on uh, USS Forrestal. It was an aircraft carrier just outside of Vietnam on the Tonkin Gulf. Yep. Uh, July 29th, 1967, uh, there was a huge fire on board. Uh, John McCain. Uh, was on the ship as a pilot um, and there was a couple bombs that went off and exploded through the flight deck of the aircraft carrier. Uh, so every July my dad would be quiet uh, to himself. You know at the time I probably paid no attention to it um, but after serving you know you kind of could relate. Um, so there's the Vietnam veteran is in my blood and there was a Chicago Welcome Home tour back in, uh, I think it was the early, mid-80s. Um, you may have even walked right down the street. But um, Vietnam is a big part of our family. Uh, you know, a side note, we've had between my uncles, cousins, nephews, eight family members that served the military. Oh, wow. So it's, it's definitely a family of service, uh, raised on it. You know, the decorations at the house are war decorations, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, I was definitely involved in it growing up as a child. Okay. So the seeds were planted early. Absolutely. If that's fair to say. And then with kind of being in the regular world and business and that, it just didn't, it wasn't satisfying some kind of higher purpose or just sense of duty that it, you still kind of had and wanted to fulfill. Absolutely. Okay. So then how'd you pick Army? Well, funny story. Uh, I wanted to go into special operations in the Navy. Um, keep in mind, I was 32 uh, at the time, and I was probably a little bit overweight. I was heavily overweight at the time. Um, but uh, I went and saw a Navy recruiter, and um, she was telling me about her Tasami experience. And I'm like, Tasami? And uh, what she wanted to say was Tsunami. Right. But, um, and it just, it stuck with me, you know, and I'm just like, you know, this lady is trying to sell me and she can't even say the word right. <laughs> That's tough. That's tough. You figure so, it out. 
So, uh, <laughs> damn Navy recruiters, what the hell? So, so I went over to the Army and uh, walked in the door, and the recruiter said, What do you, what could I help you with, Grandpa? Um, you need to lose some weight if you're coming in here. So, uh, I went back to work for six months, got a personal trainer, and did some work and went in. Um, told my father, and he wasn't happy. I told him I was gonna join the military, and he's like, Great, Navy. And I'm like, no, Army. He's like, computers? And I'm like, no, infantry. And he called me an a-hole and basically said congratulations. And I know he's proud of me. Big time proud of me. So, yeah. That's a moment, isn't it? Big moment. It's yeah. a huge moment. It's a proud moment for both of us. Yeah. Um, you know, I think those stages in life with people that are so important to us, Especially with men, and, and, I, and I don't mean in any way to shortchange women. My experience has been they communicate a little bit more effectively at times than men do, but I can only speak from where I'm at. But I just know some of those key moments in life, sometimes we don't, we kind of sense it, but we don't necessarily articulate it or we won't acknowledge it and that kind of thing. And so, but at least here as you're sitting here today, you both knew that that was a pretty significant moment. And you felt it wasn't just a kind of a sense of purpose in your own life but it had to feel good to know that he supported your decision and um, felt proud of you uh, for taking up, taking up the call. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It was a great moment. I mean, you know, I think someone to follow in his footsteps, it was a proud moment for him. Right. Big time. All right, that's pretty cool. You know, my life's okay, but it's really not like, you know, I'm not burning alive with a fire getting up every day. That's kind of how it sounded. Yep. Um, and so that, and then we also, and so that recognition and then taking, and then actually having the courage to take advantage of it and do something about it. And I really like the story about taking six months to go get in shape a little bit and kind of be ready for it. I had no choice. Yeah. So they, okay. Yeah. They had a little weight <laughs> restriction and all that. Yeah. They kind of, yeah. It's, it's, there's a lot to that story. I know that because I've heard that story before with some other people, but, and then also the interaction that you had with your dad. So, all right, now you're off. And so from 2008 to 2012, you are in, uh, let's see, I've got Fort Wainwright, Fairbanks, Alaska. Yeah. Okay. So what do we need to know about that time period as far as your military duty? Well, uh, obviously infantry, uh, U.S. Army infantry, I served uh, or did basic training at Fort Wainwright or at Fort Benning, Georgia. Yep. Uh, I was there for approximately four months. Um, during basic training, I was told that I was going to be stationed in Hawaii. Um, so there was a group of us that were so excited, and then three days before we graduated, we were told it's the other 25th Infantry Division stationed in Fort Wayne, or Fort Wainwright, Alaska. So, you know, regardless, Hawaii, Alaska, both beautiful places. Yep, no doubt. Okay, and then again, what uh, your primary duties while you were for those four years in infantry? Infantry, what do you what do you do as an infantryman when you're stationed at a base? Uh, it's ugly life. Uh, infantryman life on a base is a lot of tedious work, a lot of weapon cleaning, uh, grass cutting, garbage picking up, you name it, we did it. Uh, as far as what I did, uh, I deployed to, can we talk about deployment right now? Go, go, yeah. Um, I served, I went to Iraq September of 08 to September of, or to September of 09. Um, during that time, I was a rifleman. Um, it's my first deployment, and um, you know, after that, I had one more deployment. I went to Afghanistan, served in uh, 2011, and then honorably discharged in 2012. Okay. Um. So we talked a little bit about this. I, I don't know. Are there pieces of your deployments? You know, for your story that you want to share or that are important for folks to understand uh, a little bit? You know, I think I have stories like everyone else, but I think the most important thing that I could say is that we served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we could talk about how we got out of those places or how we're still in some of them. Um, as soldiers, we signed up to do a job and regardless of how we ended up leaving the country as a whole, 
uh, we did our job honorably and we did our job with purpose we were kind courteous to the people um, there's nothing more that you should be ashamed of you should be proud of your service and um, you know it's a it's a big deal I mean think about it you serve a country and you're in a foreign land helping people try to get their lives back together and your hands are tied but um, you know you did the best job that you can and going forward it's something that you did and you should be proud of it well when you when you describe it that way is there a sense within the military community among men and women that served in those deployments because they were I mean it, honestly being in the States it just like was never-ending right you know, you know what I mean and, right. I mean, and I grew up in a time as we were talking like I watched Walter Cronkite every night on the <laughs> evening news mm -hmm. And it was a body count. Yep. You know, and it was in your face the whole. Vietnam. Nothing's changed, right? I mean, it's the same thing. Body count after body count. And and so, but I mean, as returning, and I guess you know, there's this propaganda that somehow, as a country, we learned a lesson about the way in which military veterans, because the war was so, at least deeply opposed to, at least in some, you know, populations. Um, and and these two wars, while there was opposition to it, there's at least here there was a sense that there was support for the troops, there was some politics still going on, people not believing that we should be there, but it wasn't aimed at the men and women that were serving. But once you got back, I mean, was there a feeling that you shouldn't be proud of your duties or what, what was accomplished there? I mean, um, No, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, I think the main purpose of me saying that is, I think a lot of veterans are questioning their time and service yeah. in Afghanistan. Okay, just the functionality yeah, of- Correct. Yeah, not- like it, they themselves, but just that Correct. we probably could have made different, either we should go all the way or get out Absolutely. or do something. <laughs> Absolutely. Strategically, they might not have been all in with what we were doing and how we were doing it. Correct. Yeah, okay. That's certainly understandable. Yeah. So, okay. But not once have I had anyone that I could recall that was not happy with their service, right. you know, while serving. I, I would say too, that because the, the generation of veterans that we have the opportunity to interview, they've served in this, you know, those same capacities. And so, and I think there is that there's in the back, there's some underlying kind of questions unresolved, I think. Um, but on the other hand, a great sense of pride about the way in which the U.S. military operated themselves, the way they conducted business, and overall, I mean, really the impact that they had on those countries when they were able to do what they were asked to do. Absolutely. Yeah. There shouldn't be any ounce of guilt. I mean, you should be prideful of your service. Okay. Well, okay then. So after getting out of Afghanistan around 2011, um, then you chose not to re-up. And how old? So you got out in 2012. And how old were you then? Uh, 37. 37. So just really a youngster in military terms. but. <laughs> spring chicken. Spring chicken. So, well, what was the what led up to the decision about? Uh, had you already kind of formulated that that was going to be the end? Did you? Uh, yeah, the the plan was to serve four years and get on with my life. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So four was in and out. In and out. Okay. So discharge, and then as as you look back on that military service now, I'm just always kind of like you know whether major lessons either by yourself or life that you kind of look back on and I know the military is I, I, at a very minimum you call it a strong opportunity for growth because they kind of they <laughs> shove it right down your throat yeah. pretty well growth the key word yeah so I mean I mean what, what 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 lessons maybe from your military experience did you carry with you or would you say or just are there a couple things that really peak um, I think over time I was able to formulate my response to those questions. I don't think it right away, it was something that I thought of too much. Uh, when I got out, I was so focused on getting a career, starting my family. Um, but uh, it's, what was the question again? Well, any core lessons after, when you, now looking back on your military experience, are there, yeah. obviously it shaped yeah. your life a lot. Absolutely. Because I mean, you're from a military family and now you have your service in. Obviously, two deployments, you know, the experiences there, and then just the lessons being in the military, the discipline and skill sets and that kind of thing. I just was wondering, like, what kind of, were there real core dimensions that you look back on now that have st stuck with you that you really look to as strengths for you? Um, 
like I was saying, I think when I first got out, uh, I didn't put too much emphasis on that. Uh, I was just so charged up, excited to be home, excited about life, a new opportunity, new beginnings. Um, but um, I think the biggest thing that I take away from the military is live every day like it's your last. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. Time's not guaranteed. And one minute things could be going great, and the next minute all hell could be breaking loose. That's just not military life, that's life itself. And I think the more you realize that as time went on, you know, I experienced a few other things since getting out of the military, but I think time and uh, just seize the opportunity that you have. And I guess I'll just summarize that. I didn't want to make sure I didn't cut you off, but um, in the military, certainly as a rifleman and infantry, when you're in a combat area, um, having an appreciation about the, I guess, the reality of your mortality and your vulnerability because it could be your last. So this notion though, and then taking that into today's world, because certainly it's easy just to kind of slip into routine and you kind of fall asleep a little bit. And and, and honestly, and it, it really, I, and I just want to make the connection, um, all of our listeners will know, I mean, we spend a lot of time, our, our, all of our work that we do is based out of a mindful meditation background uh, with kind of, you know, not steeped entirely, but informed by some of the Buddhist traditions around mindfulness and certainly appreciating our mortality and being aware of that, trying to live in the moment and stay here and not dwell on the past or not look too far ahead and that kind of thing and just see how pretty that blue sky looks and even the crack in the cement might be a wonder that you might have overlooked if you're not paying attention. So um, anyway, so I really appreciate that. And I just want to make sure anything else on that or any other lessons from the military between these cuts. Okay. All right, then. So, so now we get out. All right. And so this is this part, journey into life after the military. Here's what I got. So you'd sent me some information. So the quote that I put down for this heading is, well, it didn't go as planned. So it sounds like so much for our best laid plans, right? And then you described it as mostly enduring and overcoming obstacles. And so if it's okay, maybe I'll just summarize some of the things that you sent Absolutely. me and then I'll just, and then you can kind of fill in. So. In 2013, once you got back, uh, you ended up getting divorced? Correct. Okay. And then, within the next two years, your wife was diagnosed and with lung cancer and then died again fairly quickly through that diagnosis. Correct. All right. And out of that marriage, you had one son? Correct. Okay. And so, obviously, through the divorce and obviously with her death, then you became the primary care provider and custodian for him. At 13 okay. months. 13 months. Brand new. Brand new. Brand new. No no, no tread on the... Brand new son, brand new dad. There you go. <laughs> okay. Let's get started. All right, then. So that was in 2013, and you can come back and fill us in. And then fast forward, COVID hits, and your dad um, obviously got COVID, and in April 2020 passed. And then two years later, your mom is diagnosed with cancer, and again, passes in April 2022. Um, and I know you talked a little bit about your move and that you were working with your brother as a primary care provider. Correct, During correct. that time, okay. So I guess, why don't you fill some of that pieces in for us, um, kind of the impact again about enduring and overcoming. So here you are back from the military and that, and, and I don't know, and again, you said you were really focused on getting a career going. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about the career that you entered into. And um, and then obviously you were able to get married and start your family. And that took a turn that you hadn't quite expected. So fill us in on some of those pieces. Absolutely. So uh, in 2010, I met my wife online. Uh, you know, that's kind of a new thing nowadays. Back in 2010, it was still fairly new. Um, but I met her and she was in California. I was in Alaska. Um, so that's when our marriage started. Uh, we ended up having a kid December of 2011, um, little baby boy. And shortly thereafter, uh, my wife relapsed on some drugs and it was a really tough subject. I mean, I've never been around that stuff in my life. Um, you know, it was new to me. I wanted to protect my my wife and my family, but 
someone that's going through an addiction, which I've learned, you know, since then is they're not the same person. It's, it's, they're taken over by the drugs and they become someone that you don't even know. Um, so during that time, I had no choice. I struggled with it. I had legal papers to file for six months before I actually filed them. Um, I think the military veteran in me, you, you want to help you try to fix something. But there's no fix in something that uh, chemicals are controlling. So um, what I had to do was leave. I had to get my son out of there. He was 13 months old at the time where I, when I filed. And here I am in an apartment with a 13-month-old learning how to make bottles, change diapers. I mean, it was an experience. It was a humbling experience, actually. Um, so that was... That went on for a few years um, while we were going through the divorce and she was diagnosed with lung cancer at the end of 2015 and by May of 2016 she had passed. I mean, it just struck her really quick. Um, you know, at the time my son was four when she passed away. Um, I'd love to say that he handles it great, but I think it's more of a, I don't remember. Um, so there's a lot of pictures and stuff hanging up all over the house of his mom. I tell him stories. You know, keep the memory alive. That's probably the most important thing. Um, so that happened in 2015, 2016. In 2016, I ended up moving back here to Chicago. Um, both my parents were dealing with cancer at the time. My dad had kidney cancer. My mom had lung cancer, breast cancer. Uh, my mom was also paralyzed since 2012. She had a rare uh, spinal cord virus attacker, and she was walking one day. The next day, she was completely paralyzed from the chest down. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, you don't expect getting out of the military. I came out. I was excited. I was on all the job boards, all the social uh, websites, doing the right thing, networking. But sometimes things don't go as planned. Um, so once I did get home, I realized it was probably the best thing to do is to help my mom and dad. My brother at the time was taking care of my dad and my mom. So it was nice for me to give them an extra hand. Um, caregivers aren't, it's not an easy job. Um, so it was, it was a tough situation dealing with both parents, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think being a caregiver to your loved ones is probably the most honorable job you could have. Um, so, transition, I guess what I would say is no matter what your plan is going to be, always have a backup plan, um, <laughs> a plan B, a plan C. Um, during this time, I got into some dark places. I was depressed. I had anxiety. Um, I was just barely hanging on. Um, I didn't open my mail. I didn't want to hear any bad news whatsoever. I, it just was so much of an emotional roller coaster. I had to physically shut down. My only priority was my son, getting him to school every day, doing his homework after, and making sure he was fed. That was it. So, what were you, what were you doing for work during that time? Um, well, I came home. Uh, I left my job. I was working for Coca-Cola Refreshments out of uh, Long Beach, California. Um, but it was a lot. I was working on weekends, and I was a newly single, full-time parent. And you know, corporate world doesn't care what you're doing as a as a single father. They want you at work doing your job. Um, both Coca-Cola, and then I worked for the VA, Long Beach VA. Um, they were both okay, but the amount of time that I had to take off, not only for daycare, childcare, but for court, uh, medical appointments, it was a big burden. So did what I could to maintain, and then, um, you know, COVID hit. Uh, in early 2000, we were all kind of like, what the heck is this? Um, in early April, April 8th, my dad fell down off his bed. So my brother and I went in there to get them, and as I was getting them, I started dry heaving. Uh, 
my dad hurt his knee, so we got him back up in bed, and he said he wanted to go to the hospital, so we called an ambulance. They came and picked him up. Four hours later, they called and said he had COVID. Um, I'm throwing up in the bathroom. My brother's throwing up, so we all had COVID. Uh, my mom got COVID. My son got COVID. He had a headache for a day. That was his experience with COVID. Um, so April 8th, my dad went into the hospital, the VA hospital, and uh, 10 days later, just lost his battle and uh, he was gone um, so you know my dad was my best friend um, you know it was, it was huge and that's when reality hit you know it's time to wake up my mom was ill with cancer my dad just passed now during that time I think the biggest thing was it's time to get healthy you know, my mom's struggling with her health. My dad probably wouldn't have died if he had better health. You know, you don't know. I'm not going to look back and say it could have been better, it could have been worse. But at the end of the day, our health's our most important asset. And if we can't take care of our bodies, we're not going to be able to do anything else. Can't help anyone. So it was a big eye opener when I lost my father. Yeah. Well, Losing our best friend, and particularly when it's your dad, is it's really painful. So I'm very sorry for that. No, it's right. Thank the, you. Um, and within the whole COVID thing, there's there's a whole lot we could probably unpack around those things as well, and getting through the VA and those kind of pieces. But I know that was a really difficult time. I, I know for many, myself included, I had it in March that of 2020, and uh, and actually through George, the because the, the Niners were all over it with the NFL and what they were doing. And supposedly they had a contact. We were living in Nashville, and uh, we got a hold of that doc. And honestly, the guy he just said, "Look, if you have any way you can stay home, don't come here, because everybody that's coming to the hospital get sick, and they're dying for the most part. Because mm -hmm. we don't have enough of anything. We have no idea what we're doing, and we're just barely figuring it out. So yeah, no, I, I stayed at home for two days, slept in a chair sitting up because I couldn't lay down because my lungs were so full of shit." And I just kept doing my yoga and I kept doing all my breathing exercises and, you know, I ended up having long COVID, but that's a whole other story. But the way in which it impacted and then losing somebody so quickly, so. Yeah, it was, it was quite a shocker, right. quite a shocker. Okay, so, but now the next journey, I called it Journey into Healing <laughs> and you called it Changing the Tide. So tell me a little bit about, so now both parents are gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so you're trying to figure things out a little bit. COVID is starting to ease up, or at least we're getting our finger, head around that a little bit. So what is changing the tide to you, and what, is, what did that mean for your life? After, after uh, my mom passed away, uh, you know, there's a lot to deal with. There's a, and a whole estate of my mom and dad, all their belongings, the house that they lived in. Uh, that in itself is a mess. Um, but I was in a dark place. I, I had no desire to do anything other than to maintain my uh, position as dad for my son. Uh, I didn't go out. I didn't really talk to anybody. The only thing I did was hang out with my MVP group on Wednesday nights. Um, so changing the tide. Uh, you'll hear about it. A lot of people refer to it as like their last name and their luck. Uh, for us, it was always the Busher luck. Um, you know, we had my uncle pass away from cancer, and then just a year and a half later, it was my father, and then a year later, it was my aunt, all on the same side. And when you sit back and think about all these things, and it, you know, it just boils down to your health, um, some of these things could be prevented. So at that time, um, getting into doing physical activity. I have a bad back, bad neck. In 2014, they're gonna put two plates in my neck. I chose not to. Um, I think it was the longest recovery of not doing anything, but at the same time, it was the right decision because I didn't go forward with the, uh, the plates. Um, so, um, health is my priority. So I did what I could and I like riding my bicycle so I went out and saved up some money and bought a new Trek road bike um, and decided at this time that I was going to uh, 
ride a thousand mi- or a hundred miles for each of my buddies that I served with that either lost their life during combat or lost their life after through suicide or other medical issues. Um, so in March of 2021, I set off to ride. Um, so I did that all summer long. Um, it was actually on this day last year when I completed 1,100 miles. Today? Today, one year ago. Oh. Um, so the reason I is 1,100, I'm kind of jumping around and I apologize. No, but, you're um, good. It's 1,000 miles, 100 miles for each of my buddies. And then during the time, I found out one other buddy had passed away. Thankfully, it wasn't from suicide, but it doesn't matter. He's gone. So I added another 100 miles to get a 1,100. Um, so that's all I did. Every day, I'd just get on my bike. And whether it was 5 miles or 25 miles or 50 miles, I just went out and did it. Um, and it became therapeutic to me. And as you mentioned earlier, it's like sitting at the top of the hill of a snow pile. You throw the snowball down and you watch the snow just slowly build on that ball. And that's kind of how life and the journey of getting back to good health has started. I mean, consistency starts, starts with consistency and then opportunity, growth, and then I believe discipline and all those other great things happen after the fact. So just to go back, so the last summer, 2021, I spent uh, my summer riding my bike 2,000 miles. And at the time when I started, I was 286 pounds. So, uh, um, you know, I was a little worried about my bike breaking as I'd roll around on it, but uh, it held up. The trusty bike held up. And uh, that was the start of my journey back in health. Right. You described it at least it's pedaling your way out of a mental health crisis. Correct. And also a physical, not, I don't want to call it a crisis, I don't know, but obviously, you know, that's a lot of weight to carry. And so Absolutely. there's a little bit of that. And, and I can't imagine what you must feel, you know, were you about that size when your mom passed? Or? Uh, no. Uh, mom passed, what, three, four months ago? So I was... Well, on my way. Oh, that's when, I'm sorry. When your dad passed. Uh, I was, no, I was 286 when my dad passed. Yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that was the beginning of it all. Um, you know, that first month I probably lost, or that first couple months I probably lost 10, 15 pounds riding my bike, but the majority of the weight came off. Last summer, uh, I probably lost 40 pounds on my bike, and then... This year, since January, is where I lost the bulk of the weight. Right. So we know there's a triathlon out there somewhere, so we have that to come to as well. So, Absolutely. So, but the uh, so the bike really led you, and and I noticed to the gleam in your eye when you talked about your trek holding up. It's amazing the relationship that we can have with our our bikes. Absolutely. So yeah, I've got several that. So we've got a gravel and a road and you know that kind of thing i've got an original and i just can't quite let go of any of them but but it's true you spend all those miles on it and then the i don't want to necessarily call it adrenaline but the just you know after 25 plus or whatever or 50 you know when you've really worked it and you're just exhausted and the thing about it, it's like it feels like with each pedal stroke one more little ounce of the, whatever the pain is it's, 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 anyway. All right, we had a little knock at the door there, so anyway, sorry about that, Chris, but uh, I was just, um, I was pontificating from my own end about the relationship with our bicycles. So anyway, we don't have to go too far into that, but just the freedom that they give you, and I always think of that like when we travel, it's one thing to do it by car, but then when I start, I always try to take my bike with me when we're doing these trips, and like seeing a community or a town or an area by bike is just utterly different, and it really it taps into what you were talking about earlier about, you know, being present in the moment. It just, it slows the transportation down in a way that, and then you're also usually, I'm taking trails or I'm in these back roads or whatever, things I would have never seen. And it just like, it really makes me feel like I'm getting to know that. And then, you know, my body there and I'm working and my legs are pumped and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So there's just, there's so much to that in the relationship that we have with it. And I was hearing that in your story because it really, in a way, you talk about journey into healing, and so the bicycle and the event of the two, the two thousand miles in that summer. I mean, one, it it 
it helps you be present. Second, you're kind of losing all that weight. And in the realization of both of those things, your mental health, at least it sounds like you pulled yourself out of whatever it is you're going through. And I think you've described kind of anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. So how did you feel yourself with the bicycling and the physical activity? And I know that expands into other avenues here shortly. But how did the cycling lift you out of that? When did you kind of feel that or notice it? Or like, how, how did that work for you to start to feel like that mood was changing? Absolutely. Uh, I believe the first couple weeks, it was brutal. I mean, you know how it is on a road bike. The bike seat's not the most comfortable thing. Um, and being a bigger dude at the time, it's unforgiving. It's, br uh, it's brutal. Let's just say it. Yep. <laughs> it's unforgiving. But um, as the days went on, um, you know, I had mentioned uh, my, the buddies that I served with. I, I used their stories. Um, the MVP team, you know, they talked about stories of grief. You know, you got guys losing their daughters, losing their girlfriends, um, guys losing their, their buddies left and right. I mean, I believe Denver out in L.A. or Texas now, I think he personally knew like 42 people that committed suicide. Yeah. Um, and it's terrible. It's terrible, but um, the bike riding. Um, I was worried about my neck and my back, um, but you know, after a couple rides, you know, the lower back stretches out a little bit, and it it wasn't bothering me, and that in itself was a big hurdle. It was it was a big momentum pusher forward. Um, anytime I tried to do something, whether it was run, I mean trying to run at 200 and something pounds isn't isn't beneficial at all um, so I found my bike and uh, I loved it um, the physical aspect the muscles the soreness that's fine I, I could deal with that I love that um, the medical issues the back that that wasn't present so I took full advantage of it and um, you know I'd have some sore days but the bottom line is the more I rode, the better I felt. Right. That's If you can get through that first transition stage mm -hmm. and get your body acclimated to it and get used to it, because your back does, it does get used to it and it levels mm -hmm. off. And I know people complain about that. And then your shoulders and like, I always get it in my wrist when I, yep. if I've been off the bike a while, because you've got the weight mm -hmm. on your hands and your wrist and all that kind of stuff. So, so you, but you acclimated, started losing weight. Absolutely. And then, so how did the mood shift though for you? I think it was when I bought my first pair of bike shorts. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I was having a lot of problems with the saddle, the seat, um, chafing, callousing, you name it. Um, but um, as time went on, I think I started seeing that I was losing some weight. And that wasn't my goal. My goal was to honor my buddies. Right. Um, you know, I think deep down inside, that probably was the goal is to get healthy. Um, but I needed something to get me there. I needed something to push me over that edge. And once the biking came into play, um, you know, it's funny. I talk about the snowball effect um, with any equipment that you use. You know, I'm riding 2,000 miles on my bike. I got to make sure that thing's in tip top shape, yeah. uh, the maintenance on it. Um, so everything just started snowballing. I started, you know, my hip was sore. Well, you know, maybe I should stretch a little more. You know, um, I didn't have enough energy. Maybe I should eat a little more. You know, some more protein, more carbs, get it going. Um, so, you know, it was all going downhill. The momentum was building. And, um, you know, kind of going, going uphill in the right way. Yeah, right, or absolutely. Yeah. You know, going downhill, the momentum was building, like but I was snowball. definitely going I got uphill. you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, it was coming towards the end of the summer. It's getting cold out. I decided that um, the 1100 miles I, I reached the 1100 and all the guys from MVP were pushing me keep going and I said well I might as well just go to 2000 miles so um, it was this day a year ago that I completed the 1100 miles and it was this day a year ago that I said let's add another 900 right. so it took me from March to September to get to a 1100 miles but from September what is today the 7th 8th yeah. um, Eight. It's my wife's birthday, so okay, great. happy birthday, Jan. Happy birthday. So um, December 3rd is when I finished the 2,000 miles. Um, we had some nice days in the 40s. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how if you experienced riding in the cold weather, but I can't stand it. Yeah. Uh, it is brutal. Yeah, I, a lot of my riding, I'm from Iowa, so we're uh, 
plenty of like we try to extend the season as long as we can. So, but actually, 40s, 45 ish is my kind of cut. I just uh, the amount of clothing I have to wear to keep my hands and face from freezing is just because uh, if you're going, you know, 15 plus miles an hour, you know, it's hard to show much flesh, and it, you can work as hard as you want. So. Uh, Maybe that's for a younger cyclist, but yeah, my days, my days under fifty are probably over. You know, that's another thing that you mentioned about uh, speed. Um, and as I did this, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve miles an hour was my average. Yeah. And keep in mind, I'm stopping at stoplights, streets, trains, etc. Um, but at the end of it, you know, I've seen it seventeen, twenty, twenty-three miles an hour. So it was it was all progression. It was right. physically getting better. I was losing weight. Some of the momentum was beginning to build, you know, so it was a great thing. So the success physically really triggered the mental reframing of, Absolutely. Your, of your life. I mean, Absolutely. yeah. And so, and actually I talked to you that um, we just, well, so Jay, Jay's book, Unbreakable, but he kind of talks about that, but I just shared with him a couple books and I won't get into all those, but they're all focusing on the way in which the mind and the body interplay that way so that stress and anxiety in the mind can cause and relate to disease or other ill feelings within the body but then increasing strength and performance within the body can actually help the mood and all of that in the mind and so the the interplay between the two is just so powerful and really yours is a really it's like you knew there you were in that dark spot but it's not like biking by itself it's like hey this this will cure depression you know what I mean? like nobody says right. that but yet losing weight, feeling good about yourself, gaining strength, and then for your back and your neck where you turned down the surgeries and kind of had to be wondering about that, you know, is that going to be a mistake? But in the long run, the recovery is better, stronger, more natural anyway, and you don't have to deal with it. And the cycling forces you into looking at your diet a little bit more seriously, taking care of those kind of things. You start to take care of your body in better ways. You hydrate more, you get more sleep, and it just, it does. It really impacts the whole thing. And all of a sudden you're thinking, man, life's, it's hard, but you know what, damn it? I'm a tough son of a bitch, so I'm going to be okay. You're right. That's pretty cool. All right. All right. So now, but 2,000 miles wasn't enough. Huh? Well, it wasn't. Okay. So, well, and I just want to, like, was there anything else about your mindset during that time? Because our folks, we, you know, we talk about, you know, visualization, affirmations, goal setting. So there's a whole kind of conundrum of, you know, skill sets or tactics and strategies that people use for that did you when you're trying to ride the 2000 once you made that were there particular things that you did did you do any visualization or you know how, how did you approach that mental piece because here you are now embarking on another 900 miles like how did you stay motivated and get up every day and do these things um i think it was a, a variety of things um a i posted it on social media Every workout I did, I posted it, whether it was just my stats. Um, as time went on, I started doing TikTok videos, oh, adding, adding in the music. You know, I was, I was living it up. Right. Um, and I did that for two reasons. Um, one, to hold myself accountable. But the second one was to, to show my buddies, this is possible. This is gonna happen. I knew when I got to 2,000 miles that I was a changed person. I mean. The way you think, the way you process things, the way you plan your days, the way you plan your exercises, those weren't things that I was thinking about two years ago. I was thinking about getting on my bike and just going. And now, like you said, it's diet, it's nutrition, it's hydration, it's the whole, it's full circle. Right. So, you know, it's great. So your health is better and and I, I don't want to make too many broad statements about depression or anxiety, but it seems like you're in a much better place than what you had described. Mm -hmm. um, and so those things have all come back kind of full circle for you. Okay, so then, um, and, I, and I guess, you know, as you look back on that experience, and I know you've done some other things since then, so we'll, we'll work into that and then finish, but, um, you know, this whole piece is about kind of healing and taking care of those transitions. And so... Um, you know, one thing that Susie always talks about, you know, that the military experience and when we are discharged or leave and come back out, um, yes, what happens in the military is important and can impact us, but more often her experience has shown us that it just exacerbates or 
brings out or highlights what was already going on in our life before that. You know what I mean? Like the yep. early childhood trauma or whatever those kind of things were, the military is just like adding gas to those things. Absolutely. And so then when you come back out and you don't have the structure of the military, it's like, you know, the military kind of kept all those things under wraps to some extent because you had to, because you're in uniform, you're serving, you're doing your duty. But then when all that is gone, now you layer on the military experience plus whatever else you were already dealing with, and then it kind of goes amok. For mm -hmm. people. And then, so that combination is really, really hard for people. So you've faced a lot of those things down and have kind of worked through your own healing on that journey Absolutely. Uh, with some of those pieces, and particularly uh, in some of these events, really uh, were post-military mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. were really difficult. So, okay, so there, now, but, um, so when did you, let's talk a little bit about MVP. Okay. And then I've kind of, no surprise that you ended up going on to a triathlon just recently, August 28, 2022, completed your first triathlon. So congratulations. Thank you. It is a huge accomplishment. So like I'm a swimmer, biker, an occasional runner, but I, I don't know if I got enough run in me left. But, Same in that order. So <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But anyway, so tell us, tell us about when you got plugged into MVP and just because we are here around merging vets and players. So. How did you get involved and how has that aided you or assisted you in your journey? All right, so uh, ironically, I was in California at the time. It's okay. Okay. Um, I was in California at the time, um, probably actually doing some legal paperwork on my own. Um, and I saw Jay and the crew on TV discussing uh, MVP. Now, at that time, I just was so bogged down, uh, closed-minded, focusing on one thing, and that was just my survival. Um, so I never really thought anything of it other than, man, that would be awesome to be a part of. Uh, so shifting three years later, I'm here in Chicago, back home, and uh, I just saw it pop up on the uh, one of the veteran sites, the MVPs coming to Chicago. So day one, I showed up. And uh, I was really intimidated. There's a bunch of dudes with big biceps, arms rolled up. Yeah, like, come on. And, uh, you know, they're all having a good time. And I'm just a quiet kid sitting in the back, just kind of observing. And I'm like, this isn't for me. I mean, these guys are huge muscle guys. I'm, you know, it's just above me. Right. Um, but, 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 as soon as I got in the door, everyone's welcoming me, open arms. Where are you, where are you from? Where'd you serve? Um, and then the rest is history. Um, MVP, you know, four years, every, every week I showed up. Um, you know, I don't think there's many other people in, that, in the Chicago chapter that have been there more than I have. Um, and I take pride in that. Um, showing up is what leads to opportunity. Everything um, else. Everything else. I, I, I shouldn't even say opportunity. Everything else. A um, couple big things that happened through MVP. Um, Olin Krutz, center for the Chicago Bears back in the day, came in, talked. I'm sitting there doing push-ups next to Olin Krutz. This guy's a beast. Um, Kyle Schwarber from the Chicago Cubs. Yeah. He uh, invited a group of us out to the game. Um, and then he invited uh, four of us out to uh, Orlando for his celebrity golf outing. And so four of us went out there, we're playing golf. And you know, those opportunities are probably things that I'll never get to do again. But it was the right time and it provided hope. You know, it's like, here's an opportunity. I was staying at the five star, is it Regis? I don't know what hotel it is, but it's the Ritz, Ritz Carlton in Orlando. I walk in, there's this huge TV, it's got my name on it. Welcome, Mr. Bush. I mean, <laughs> you know, there's such little things, but it was just this is this is out there. This is something that, you know, experience it, soak it all in. So I'm up in the twenty something floor, just sitting on my balcony, just staring out, you know, yep. absorbing it. These are things that gave me opportunity, gave me hope, gave me, you know, an inside look at what life's like on, the, on that side and those were huge moments in my life um, they may not have directly correlated to me jumping on my bike but it was all part of the journey um, so there's been some great athletes that have been through in Chicago probably I wish there was more I mean I'm not gonna lie but um, 
those athletes helped me and the members. Uh, we got guys, the city's so diverse and our group of core veterans in that group are just as diverse. Um, is it perfect? No. Um, but we have all walks of life. We got very talented people. We have great guys. We got guys that are running, just ran 60 miles from the Wisconsin border to the downtown Chicago, called it the Wisco Thunderbolt 500 or 60. Uh, we got a guy getting ready to run the rim, rim to rim, rim on yeah. the Grand Canyon. Kevin? Yeah, Kevin, yeah. Kevin Hill's doing that. Yeah. Aaron's the one that just did the 60 miler from Milwaukee to Chicago. Eden, we got another guy who's uh, going to be flying out to Doral here in a couple weeks or days to compete in the Veteran Golf Association Championship. Um, we got a couple guys that are just selected to Kilimanjaro to do the Kilimanjaro hike with the Chris, Chris Long, Long Foundation. Foundation yeah. when, when's that? Like? I believe that's in February. February, next February, yeah. So, and we just had another guy do that this past February. So. The opportunities, the stories, um, MVP, it's a life changer for me. Um, you know, I went in there days where I didn't want to go, um, but someone would tell a story and just one part of that story would click. Yeah. And it wasn't just the negative stories. We have a couple guys that are doing really great. They got Airbnbs and they come in and they joke around and tell great stories. Well, you know, it's just like last night, really, you know, I mean, Someone would kind of talk, start to talk, and there'd be parts of the story, this was my struggle, this was hard, I was disappointed in this, and then it would come full circle, And but I got a call back on the new job, or I got this, and it was just kind of like, just hearing the reality of life, and what, last time we had two people talk about cancer diagnoses, so that's pretty real, mm -hmm. and just being able to share that with a group that are non-judgmental, mm -hmm. and share kind of a common connection, there's just, being in that environment, there's just something that's healing about it because you know there's not gonna be any judgment. You don't have to pretend to be anybody. You can be authentic. And if there's something on your heart and you want to share it, that's the place for it. And so there's kind of, it, it's just, it opens up. I, I, last Our last podcast, we talked about creating what we call healing portals. And they're not necessarily like a physical thing. But it's kind of a, it's a chemistry that once people are together in a certain place and they're together in a certain way, that it opens up the opportunities for people to find healing mm -hmm. because everybody's journey is different, yeah. everybody's pain is different, but yet there are kind of common elements that allow people to move toward healing. So it certainly sounds like the weekly huddles for you through MVP, it was a connection, it was a hope provider, a strength provider. Plus, one thing too is like either somebody has an answer or a lead or gets, has a connection or they're going to find out and try to help you. So there's just so many resources available too. Yeah, absolutely. Through. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, very cool. All right. So then that wasn't all enough. You decide somehow, by gosh, if I can ride a bike this far, I could probably I could probably swim five miles in open water. Is it five or is it more than that? And I can ride my bike a hundred miles for sure. That's a piece of cake in a day. Oh yeah, and I let me run a marathon as well. So tell us then about the transition. Like when did you decide I'm gonna hey, I got two thousand miles in, I'm gonna do a triathlete triathlon. And how did all that training go? And tell us a little bit about that story. Right, right. So uh, December of uh, 2021, um, I was feeling good. I uh, just completed 2,000 miles on my bike. My confidence is coming back. My uh, energy is there. Strength in my legs was there. Um, but I needed more. I knew this, this goal, this task has come to an end. I can't just stop and go back right. to my old life. Right. Um, so I, I said I got Because you weren't the same person. No, no. I mean, you no. know, in one hand, it's still us, mm -hmm. but like think of all the layers that have been stripped away. It's like almost every mile that you rode, mm -hmm. some of the pain left, you know, the self-awareness grew, you know, you were leaning your body down, your cardio's going up, you're taking over, and then it's almost too like, you know, Jay calls it, you know, his gray matter, you know, when he's in that fog. But it's like almost like if you can ride long enough and hard enough, you can clear, you can clear the gray away at least at least temporarily. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So you you're 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 the same person, but you're not even close to being the same person. Not even, not even close. Right. I mean, if you see me a year ago, I mean, I was feeling good a year ago. Yeah. But not to where I am today. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
So then triathlon line. So what, when did you decide? So December, you finished the 2000. Correct. Yeah, and then what, what, you were looking on the horizon like, what am I going to do next? And how did you get to this? So I had no clue that I wanted to do a triathlon um, in December. <laughs> um, I just knew I needed to do something. Right. Um, and I needed to challenge myself. I, you know, I always hear people say, get out of your comfort zone. Um, and I never knew what that meant. I mean, I, I had an idea. But what does it mean to get out of your comfort zone? Yeah. Yeah, well, it means signing up for something you don't like doing right. and over a long period of time. Um, so triathlon, you know, the bike, I knew I could do. The swimming, I knew I could swim, but I hadn't swim since high school. Um, and running, I despised. Um, so the original goal was to just sign up for a sprint triathlon, which was like a three, a 5K you know, a couple hundred meter swim, uh, 15 mile bike ride. But as January 1st, January 1st is when enrollment or sign up started. So I was eyeing that day. And uh, over time I just said, well, if I'm gonna do this, why do a sprint, you know? Just go for the big international distance. If you're gonna do it, just do it. So uh, January 1st, um, you know, I was talking to my mom. My mom wanted, you know, at the time she was still alive, um, she wanted to pay for it. She wanted to pay for my triathlon. So I agreed, and um, she paid for it. And um, January 1st, I went outside. It was snowing, and I uh, started running. I got about a quarter of a mile, and I was huffing and puffing. Like, <laughs> you know? And I already posted online that I'm going to go do the triathlon in August. So I go out and start running. And a quarter of a mile, I couldn't even do it. But then, you know, I walked a little bit, and I just started running. And I... January 1st, I was, I was scared. I'm like, what did I get myself into? Um, but I didn't let that deter me. Uh, January 2nd, jumped in the pool. Went there, it's a 25 yard pool, went there and back, out of breath, couldn't even go. So I had my base, uh, I was at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> the only way up, the only way up is up. Um, so from January till um, August, you know, I started out just doing one exercise or one event a day. Um, started studying a little bit online of what I could do to get my body better right. Started um, meal prepping, uh, counting my calories. Um, although it was very vague, I started. And that's, that's the most important thing is starting. So over time, I got into some swimming classes. I got into some spin classes and I joined couple of the uh, shred and tread at the gym oh. um, just to kind of get an idea but the bottom line is I just got out there and did it um, you know eventually built my uh, distance um, capacity etc and what I found out was I love being in the suck I, lo I love it um, it's like you said the gray matter that's where you're you're in there and you're just there's that's no where, space for it that's where I'm at and it's yeah. it's peaceful yeah um, and that's, that's carried over from the 2,000 mile bike to the triathlon into the future. Well, very cool. Well, all right. So we got triathlon, so congratulations again. That was the first Olympic. And so then when's the next race? Or what, do you have another, do you have another thing coming up? Or what so, are you planning? So um, the next steps are, you know, it's funny because I, I do have it planned out. Um, the, in my head of what the plan is. So the last six years I've spent basically taking care of family members. I took care of my dad, I took care of my mom. Now, with all that behind me, it's a fresh start. Um, you know, everyone's at, at, at their place of peacefulness. I'm at my peacefulness. Uh, and um, so now my next step's a job. Um, bottom line is I need to start uh, bringing in some income and self-worth. Yeah. Um, you know, sitting around, taking care of your family, your parents is rewarding in some ways, in many ways. Um, but having that work where you, you put in the time and then you come home and enjoy the rest of the day because you worked hard. I miss that. Um, so that is my number one priority. The second priority is having some fun with my son. Um, my son's endured a lot. You know, he lost his mom at four and um, you know, he lost his grandfather to COVID and then uh, his grandma. 
and it's 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 been a rough ride so you know i want to maximize the time with him get him out on vacation get him to florida he wants to go to legoland so we're going to go to legoland this christmas um it's something that i'm going to do with him um but as far as physical as far as me um I don't know what I'm going to do as far as triathlon. I am absolutely hooked. So there is triathlon in my future. Which races, which distances, I don't know. But in the meantime, I'm back at it. I'm out riding. I probably got 150 miles in the last two weeks on my bike. Um, about 40 miles running. Um, and I'll get back in the lake before it gets too cold here, but I'll be back in the pool. Um, the point of that is you could sit back and try to let the stars align or let your master plan get into place or I'll get it on Monday. It's not gonna work, um, not with me anyway. So um, I'm gonna get back into it. Uh, there's a possibility of uh, another triathlon here in two weeks at the University of Illinois. Heard you say that last night. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'll have to figure out logistics for that. It, it may be a possibility. Uh, let's be honest, it's probably gonna happen, but um, I just need to make sure it's something that I could do. Um, but, uh, you know, I love it. It's the competition, the adrenaline. Um, those are all things. And it's it's basically a showcase of all the hard work that you put in. Right. Um, so I love being in the grind. I love the competition. I love the running. And it's something that I'll continuously do going forward. Well, very cool. So let's wrap up because I know we have a young man waiting for you and I don't yeah. want to keep you too long. So uh, just Mike, we do like, and, and you've talked a lot about, a lot of things in here are hard, but there's also a lot of hope involved. So is there, are there one or two things just given on your experience that gives you hope now in the mornings when you wake up? What, what things cause you to be inspired and or create hope? Yeah, I think the hard work and effort that I put in, uh, the ability that I know I could do it. The stories of my brothers and sisters, I mean, you heard some of them last night, and that's some raw stuff. And um, I'll take that with me. I'll, I'll, I'll burden that pain, uh, you know, and use it as fuel. Um, the things that I would say, I see to fellow veterans, or even family members, or just friends, uh, it's never too late to start uh, your journey physical journey, whatever journey it may be. Um, you know, sure, I'd love to be on the podium at a triathlon, but that's not the point. The point's to just do it, experience it. Um, to my friends and family, I just say, keep going, don't give up. Uh, absorb what you can, reach out. Uh, there's plenty of resources out there for people to get involved in. If not, reach out to me personally, I, I, I don't care. But, um, Stay strong, keep hope alive. Okay. Well, the journey can never get finished if you don't start. True. So, and I think in looking at the research and the data on people reaching their goals, more people never start because they're so afraid of not finishing and be considered a failure. But there's there's no failure in trying. Right. And I think that's what we're encouraging people to do is just take that first step, create a support community for yourself, and and for our listeners, they've heard this 10,000 times on this podcast because it's kind of our motto is small, consistent steps all taken in the same direction lead to amazing results. Love it. They don't have to be giant steps. It just know where your North Star is. Know the direction you're trying to get to and just do the things that day that you can do within the realm of your possibilities and just keep taking those small steps. Just like for you riding that bike, you know, first it's five miles and then you get to 10 miles and then you tweak the bike a little bit and then you're eating better and then all those small steps start to cascade in because the reality is if you're not you're still taking small steps it's just going the other way if you're sitting on the couch eating potato chips each chip you put in is a small step in the wrong way right nothing against potato chips i like them, but right you know what i'm saying and so just paying attention to that so all right well then um you're clearly on Twitter or TikTok and or Instagram. And so if people want to support you, can they find you there? Yeah, uh, Chris Busher on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, TikTok, cbusher12. Okay. Um, or just by my name. Um, and will you I'm, text me all those things? Absolutely. And we'll put them in the show notes. So if folks want to help support the next journey and where you're heading, 
they can do that or at least follow along and offer their support with you as well as that goes. Absolutely. Okay. Anything else I didn't ask you that if I was smarter or brighter or more insightful, I should have asked? Um, well, not necessarily, but just to all the brothers and sisters out there that are struggling. I know there's a few of them here. I know there's other states, other uh, locations. Um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to jump in there. And you got to give yourself, if you're going to go try to lose some weight or you just want to make a change, give yourself two months. Give yourself a couple months to, to see the change, to notice the change. If someone's going to go on a diet, you're not going to see changes in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. You're not. Stick with it and you're going to see the changes. But you got to stick with it to see the changes. And that's pretty much it. So we're encouraging get started. Get started. Get out there. And do it. I, th I think, too, just be patient and have some grace with yourself and forgiveness. Because I think a lot of people are so hard on themselves if they like they can't run the way that some people think they might or they can't do this. Or they, don't focus on what you can't do. Focus on what you can do and just do that. And eventually it, it'll evolve. Absolutely. I think the biggest thing is just get started. Just get started. Um, you know, just real quick, uh, when I first started, I didn't focus on a diet. My, my goal was to exercise. And I think the consistency of my exercise made me realize, well, if I'm going to keep eating junk, I'm wasting my time doing this. So it changed. Yeah. And I think... The momentum will carry you, but you just got to stick with it two, three months. Yeah, you don't have to do everything at once. Nope. Yeah, just take your time. So, all right, a lot of love and support, uh, reaching out to the MVP folks. And if you're not in the MVP, it's all good. Uh, but there are, is support out there. And Chris invited direct messages on Instagram if you have questions and or uh, anything else that you want to share. So, Chris, we really, really, really appreciate your time. and wish you very well on your journey. And we look forward to more news and results from the uh, Chris Busher triathlon, soon to be professional at some level, uh, whether it in work or in sports. So that's great. So thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your time. Thank right. you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Hidden Pearls podcast. Um, this is technically episode one of season three. Woohoo! Um, if you guys are interested in getting some Hidden Pearls podcast merchandise, we have a few of the HPP Unite black golf hats available. Um, and we call them the golf hats because the style of hat that I ordered is George's favorite workout hat. He literally wears it all the time to train. And so we wanted to design a workout hat for the guys um, to give out a tight end you and for year two for that. And so these are the hats. Um, you will be getting the exact same model that was given to every single one of the tight end you invites. Um, so yeah, get one. Uh, the ones that are left, they come with a signed George Kittle playing card. And I actually had him sign those right before he went off to camp. So he loved me very much for that. Um, but he's also very excited to kind of send them out and do that. So yay, get your hands on one. Um, there's a link for that in the bio of our Instagram. Um, and we have a new website coming out soon, guys. I'm super excited. Um, also, wow. A lot of work behind that, but super pumped to release that and just kind of organize and lay our content out a little bit better for everybody. Um, and then the last thing that I just want to say is thank you guys so much for um, for everybody who shares an episode, for everybody who's left, left us a review, for who reposts our content on social media. It means so much. Um, so if you really want to help to support the show, uh, doing that in any way helps. Um, but if you subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our uh, podcast on so we're on Apple Podcast, we're on all podcast platforms. But if you would go on to the Apple Podcast and um, subscribe and leave us a five star review with a comment, that really helps us to boost our ratings and it helps us to get in front of more people. Um, this show is really intended to help people, and the best way that we can help people is to spread the message. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, thank you for being here, and let's have a great season. Go Niners. <laughs>